So good to be back home here at Wheaton. Uh, I had a fabulous time. I went to a lot of lectures along these lines uh, when I was here as part of my extracurricular major when I was uh, here. Um, I actually first got interested in North Korean matters at a World Christian Fellowship meeting here where they were talking about the famine that was going on in North Korea in the mid-90s in which a tenth of the population, it is estimated, perished from starvation during that time. And that set me on a journey where when I was applying to Northwestern for law school, in my personal statement, I wrote about how I was wanting to go there in order to be able to do something more in regards to the North Korean situation. So for me, working on North Korean matter, matters is a passion, it's a calling, it's a mission, it's something that I have devoted more of my scholarly efforts to than uh, any other subject. And it is something that is also a source of profound lament for me. Because here in North Korea, you have the worst human rights situation, bar none, in the world. And you also have the most uh, serious security crisis that is going on uh, in one place uh, in the world. And it is something that is, I think, deservedly getting increased attention worldwide in the media and elsewhere. But an angle that I want to start with that isn't talked about as much is the Christian angle. Pyongyang, once upon a time, was this considered the center of Christianity for all of Asia previously. There was a powerful revival that broke out in 1907, and Pyongyang was the epicenter of that huge revival. South Korea, in a lot of ways, has a lot of the remaining benefits of the Christian influence that came to Korea which, by the way, was completely unreached. There was no gospel witness until the latter part of the 1800s. That is when the real pioneering work of the pioneer missionaries took place. Now in South Korea, you have six out of the 10 largest Christian churches in that tiny little country. You have more missionaries sent out per capita from South Korea than any other national church in the world, any other country. Um, where, of, that has Christians in the world. And so for Pyongyang to be transformed from the Jerusalem of the East, as it was called, into the worst persecutor of Christians, bar none, in the world, is a radical transformation that has taken place. And when, after World War II, when Joseph Stalin pushed for dividing Korea in half and for the northern half to be aligned with the Soviet Union at that time. And he got what he wished for in the negotiation. Kim Il-sung, the supreme ruler of North Korea, declared that all Christian leaders, deacons, elders, pastors, would all be executed unless they renounced their faith in Jesus Christ. And so you had this systematic martyrdom and persecution of Christians that has gone on to this day, such that every study every year in regards to the per persecution of Christians worldwide has found that the persecution is worst in North Korea, whether it's Open Doors, Voice of the Martyrs, the US State Department, all of these sources every year says North Korea is the worst persecutor of Christianity. This is an angle that is covered all too infrequently with respect to what is go going on in North Korea. What is covered the most is the security crisis. The security crisis is also very serious. North Korea has the fourth largest military in the world. It has all manners of weapons, including weapons of mass destruction, whether large stockpiles of chemical weapons, biological weapons, conventional weapons, 
nuclear weapons, I think, best known. They've successfully tested an ICBM that could not only hit anywhere in the United States, it could actually shoot and fire over the United States. The range is so long at this point. There are questions technologically in regards to North Korea's ICBM technology. Can it survive re-entry into the atmosphere? That has not been demonstrated. Can it have precision guidance? That has not been demonstrated. Can it carry a heavy nuclear payload or a heavy payload in general? That too has not been demonstrated. But this is the aspect of North Korea that I find gets the most media coverage uh, here in the US and it is very serious indeed. Indeed, North Korea and the US and the UN coalition that fought against North Korea after North Korea invaded in 1950 is still at war with each other. Why? Because there was only a ceasefire armistice agreement that was concluded, which is, a, which is not a peace treaty. There has never been a peace treaty that has taken its place. And North Korea has repeatedly broken and disavowed the armistice agreement, such that legally speaking, it is already still a state of war. But there is a war inside of North Korea that also doesn't get as much attention. And this is the human rights crisis of North Korea, where you have the worst human rights crisis going on in the world. As someone who has taught international criminal law, international human rights, public international law, I'm aware of a lot of very severe human rights situations worldwide. But there is none that I know of that is worse than the human rights crisis inside of North Korea. The situation with respect to human rights in North Korea is so bad, I thought I had to create a new word to describe it. And the word is rightlessness, that the state is a state of rightlessness, the people live in a state of rightlessness in more senses than one, and there is no right of the Korean people that is upheld by the North Korean government. The biggest emblem of the human rights violations are the concentration camps in North Korea. In a National Law Journal article that I had written, someone who was uh, working on that in, for PR purposes with the university I was at objected to the fact that I described them as like the ones of Hitler, Mao, and Stalin, saying you can't say that. Uh, that, that's not something you can say. And I said, well, it's true. The description of these concentration camps is very much akin to the concentration camps of Hitler, the concentration camps of Mao, the gulags of Stalin. It is very much akin to that if you've read any accounts of those concentration camps, except they're worse because they have three generations you can be born in a concentration camp in North Korea because of a perceived political disloyalty of your grandfather or your grandmother, somebody several generations above you. This was not even true of the three other examples that I said. And so I insisted that that language go in there because I thought it was merely descriptive. It was not, one did not need to engage in pejoratives because merely being descriptive was all that was necessary in my view. And this, in my view, uh, still, is that those terms that were used uh, in terms of historical precedents were merely descriptive and accurate. What happens in these concentration camps is almost too painful to articulate publicly in words. There are some accounts that I've put in writing, but the degree of torture, the degree of suffering, the degree of extermination of their own people that takes place in these concentration camps is almost beyond words. And it is something that I have uh, shed tears over. It is something that when I get tired as I'm working on these things, I think of the people who have suffered in these ways and it gives me the motivation to keep going in my work. 
North Korea not only commits crimes and human rights violations against its own people, it does so internationally as well. Something that is not known widely is how much North Korea has sent slave labor to all sorts of places in the world where they get paid for the slave labor, not the workers, the government gets paid for the slave labor in uh, various places in the world. That is changing, I'm glad to say. China reportedly has sent back the North Korean slaves to North Korea. Russia claims, uh, has recently claimed that they would do so. Um, Poland, I think, uh, decided to do so. But they would make uh, a large sum of money based on the slave labor that they would export around the world. But of course, inside of North Korea, it's one big slave labor camp. It's one big prison camp. The whole country is. Because you can't leave. If you leave, then it's considered high treason against a government. And you are subjected to all sorts of draconian punishments if you are caught. You can't even move within North Korea freely. You need permission to cross the street in Pyongyang. You can't leave your farming village. You can't go anywhere even inside the country. And the whole country is made up of spies because everyone potentially is a spy because there are rewards for snitching on your family members, your closest friends. There's no freedom of media. Your radio dials are set to the government station and sealed to it, and breaking the seal is a serious criminal offense. They have abducted all sorts of Japanese citizens that were just on Japanese beaches and were kidnapped in order to be conscripted to teach Japanese to government officials in North Korea. When Kim Jong-il was confronted with that, he sent the government of Japan a box of ashes and said, here are your citizens back. And this has outraged and um, created quite a furor, as you could imagine, in Japan. There were tests of those ashes that found these were not the remains of the people who were abducted. But this is the sort of regime that is, uh, that is in North Korea. It is the most totalitarian dictatorship in the world. If you look at their constitutions, they have override, policy, override provisions such that the will of the supreme ruler and his party override everything else. And so while there seems to be a recitation of rights that we might recognize as a positive recitation of rights that is worthy of a constitution, given the fact that they could all be overridden and are in fact overridden by these override provisions and by the actual practice of what happens, these rights are merely illusory. They are a mirage. North Korea, therefore, presents the worst combined human rights and security crisis, bar none, in the world. It is very bleak. But I have hope. I have hope. Why do I have hope in the midst of such bleakness? Well, the f biggest reason why I have hope is because I have my hope in the Lord and what he is able to do. And what he has done to those who have pretended to be God, whether it's Herod Antipas II in the book of Acts, or whether it was Nebuchadnezzar, or whether it was other despots across the realm of history. There are many examples of what the Lord has done uh, over history to those who claim to be deity themselves. And also, I see his hand working in various ways. It is almost always Christians who are deeply involved with respect to North Korea in some cases, risking their lives in and around North Korea, who are doing all sorts of works of mercy, all sorts of works of help, all sorts of works of teaching, of making the situation better in one way, shape, or form, or another. And all sorts of people are praying in regards to the situation. I believe the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Iron Curtain was related to the prayers that were lifted up in regards to Eastern Europe. 
And just as all that transpired uh, in, uh, in the lifetime of, uh, of many of us who are here in this room, uh, I believe that it is possible that in our lifetime there could be a fundamental transformation of one kind or another. My ideal goal with respect to North Korea would be a peaceful reunification. I would love to see a peaceful reunification of North and South Korea. Is this possible? I believe it is. Is there a possibility that there could be uh, the use of force in this process? That also is a possibility as well. But if, for example, China and the US agree that we are going, and together with South Korea, that we are going to make the reunification of the Koreas happen. And we will shepherd that process and provide the um, protection for that process to take place. I think it can, it can happen. And note that China has the most cards in its hands to play in regards to North Korea. Over 90% of the trade of North Korea is with China alone. Uh, China has subsidized so much and propped up so much of North Korea. So much so that if China were to pull the plug on North Korea, North Korea would not be able to continue. At the same time, the U.S. has the most cards in its hands in regards to China. We are the largest export market for China by far. There are issues of trade, there are issues of intellectual property, there are issues of China holding the biggest amount of U.S. debt of any foreign holder of U.S. debt. Um, there's a whole array of issues that are there that the U.S. can use and has been increasingly using to try to leverage the influence that we can upon China. And if China's reports are true, then they have taken major steps in regards, to, um, in regards to enforcing, for example, the UN Security Council sanctions uh, in regards to North Korea. Now, I don't think they have done so completely. There is satellite imagery that shows Chinese vessels providing fuel to North Korean vessels, for example, that emerged not too long ago. But I do think that they have been doing more than they ever have um, in recent history in regards to uh, helping to use their tremendous clout to be able to uh, impact North Korea. China is a key player in this and if China is willing to cooperate and increasingly they're, they're showing more and more uh, willingness to do so, that would be massive. Another factor in this mix is that North Korea has been successfully alienating its best ally, China. Where North Korea has publicly denounced China and sa saying that China has betrayed it by not vetoing the UN Security Council resolutions against North Korea, for example, for doing more of what the US wants in regards to North Korea. And so North Korea has even said things like, we will no longer be merciful towards China. And so when North Korea is uh, doing missile tests, China sets up anti-missile batteries on its border with North Korea. That tells you a lot right there. And so it was also highly significant that China publicly said, if North Korea attacks first, we will not support North Korea. We will not defend North Korea. They've never said that before. They did say that if the US or someone else attacked North Korea first, then it would defend North Korea. But even that is being cast into doubt more and more as the wedge is being driven between North Korea and China more and more, especially by North Korea itself. I think it is possible, I think it is distinctly possible that there will be some basic change, in, fundamental change, in regards to the Korean Peninsula, potentially in the next seven years. I'm not predicting that, I'm not prophesying, but I am saying that it's distinctly possible. 
and I did not used to say this uh, before, but I'm seeing more factors and more convergence of factors coming to bear that can make that possible than I've ever seen before. And so, all that to say, I do have hope in regards to this bleakest of situations in the world. It could be very different, and it could potentially be a win-win-win sort of situation. How would China win through a reunification of North and South Korea? It wouldn't have refugees streaming across its border, which it fears, because the, that portion of China is economically depressed, and they don't want North Korean refugees there. If Korea is unified, they will not have a place, they will have not have the same need to flee the country, and there would not be a massive uh, exodus of refugees, which would be in China's interests. China also has economic reasons to want the reunification of the Koreas. There are trillions upon trillions of dollars worth of rare earth minerals in North Korea that if they could be efficiently and effectively mined and shipped to market, this would be a massive engine uh, economically because the North not only has more rare earth minerals by far than South Korea, it has more natural resources, period, than South Korea does. And so if there was a Trans-Siberian Railroad, which has been proposed, that could be a major piece of infrastructure that could be there. And there could be a win-win-win uh, that China could benefit from it, the U.S. could benefit from it, uh, and, and various other regional and world um, entities, uh, countries could benefit from a reunified uh, Korea. I also think that an idea worth considering that could be used in negotiations with China would be to propose to China that if China helps to reunify the Korean Peninsula, we, the United States, would withdraw our military assets from the Korean Peninsula. This would be huge for China because they don't want U.S. troops on its border. And I think the strategic, uh, strategic loss, so to say, to the U.S. would be negligible. Why? Unless the U.S. is planning a land invasion of China or that China is planning a land invasion of Korea, I don't see a tremendous need to have military assets right there on the Korean Peninsula. There are various bases, military bases in Japan nearby. There's the 7th uh, uh, Naval Fleet, which is the largest naval fleet in the world that is nearby. We have long-range strike capabilities. We have rapid mobilization abilities. To me, that sounds like a good deal to help get the negotiations going to propose to China that we'll withdraw our military assets from the Korean Peninsula if you help us to reunify uh, the peninsula, ideally um, peacefully or with minimal use of force. This is one scenario of what can happen. Another scenario is there could be a certain implosion from within North Korea. Given that's a reign of terror where nobody feels safe, nobody feels secure, and in fact nobody is safe or secure, whether you're the uncle and number two in power, who was executed by Kim Jong-un, whether you're the half-brother uh, who was assassinated in Southeast Asia, or whether you are the army chief of staff who was also executed, or whether you are a peasant, um, it doesn't matter. You are not secure in North Korea because people are executed for stealing kernels of corn, for singing South Korean pop songs, for disco dancing, for going AWOL in the military, there's a whole list of reasons why people have been executed in North Korea. And so I think there are various uh, ways in which this can happen. There could be an implosion, internal elements that can help bring it about, but also I think there's ways that external influence can be brought to bear, for example, through information, through flooding North Korea with right, true information that can counter the flood of propaganda that they get all the time. This is succeeding more and more and becoming more and more prevalent 
I remember talking with a defector on one occasion, and I said, well, you know, if you access this sort of media, it's completely illegal and you can get into a lot of trouble. Um, how common is it for people to do that? And she said, very common, very common. Because even the most totalitarian regime has all sorts of cracks and fissures and all sorts of channels by which they could be reached and the totalitarian grip can be loosened. Well, but couldn't you get tortured if you do that? Nonchalantly, yes. Couldn't you be sent to a concentration camp if you do that? With a shrug of the shoulders, yes again. But you're telling me all sorts of people are doing it anyways? Yes again. People are starved for information other than the avalanche of propaganda they, that they get day in and day out. And um, this sort of effort is, I think, accelerating, increasing, and having a positive impact uh, upon the people of North Korea in, in various respects. I do think that the more you can help the people in various ways while uh, trying to punish the leadership of North Korea, I think the more you can do both of those things concurrently, the better. One avenue to do so is to engage in prosecution of the North Korean leadership, which they reportedly fear tremendously. And so this, in turn, could be used as part of your diplomatic campaign because this is leverage, potentially, that could be very meaningful to the North Korean leadership who fear greatly the possibility of prosecution. How could this happen? There's all sorts of different ways. One possibility is a hybrid tribunal, which is part domestic and part international. Uh, the international, I spoke personally with the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, who then opened investigations on North Korea. Unfortunately, the scope of the investigations was only limited to, do, to two events, the sinking of the naval corvette, the Chonan, and the uh, shelling of Yongpyeong Island. And this is because uh, there's jurisdiction because this was done on the territory of a ratifier of the Rome Treaty, which is the constitutive treaty of the International Criminal Court. And therefore, on, the ba on that basis of jurisdiction, the ICC pursued those two matters. But in my view, it was too little, um, and there's a lot more they could do and should do if it goes that route. Another possibility is domestic prosecution within South Korea because all North Korean nationals are considered Korean nationals and therefore citizens of South Korea. You may or may not know that refugees who come to South Korea are immediately granted citizenship. All Koreans are considered Koreans under the South Korean government. Therefore, there could be personal jurisdiction of North Korean defendants in South Korean courts if the South Korean court system was willing to do so. There are rumblings about a people's tribunal potentially forming. There's a possibility of a truth and reconciliation commission for lower level defendants. There could be potentially a multivalent effort along these lines. Um, there's a number of different possibilities, but I think prosecution can be an important legal and diplomatic uh, way to approach things with North Korea that could bear fruit to help to resolve the human rights crisis and also in, in indirectly as well the security crisis of the Korean Peninsula that North Korea has caused. I teach a full course on North Korea, North Korea seminar and so obviously I can't do more than just give a brief introduction here, but I want to give plenty of time for questions so I could give you things that you are particularly interested in and want to ask about. Uh, it's so good to see the level of interest uh, that is here, and I welcome your questions, and I will uh, try to do what I can to um, scratch where it itches, so to say, in terms of what you would like to know in regards to uh, what is going on with North Korea and that whole situation. So uh, with the new technology, 
Uh, we'll see if this will work. I've never done this before, so this is the first for me, but I'm game. What do you think of the North Korean military? Are they as loyal as they are portrayed, or does it depend on the individual unit? I think the biggest bond of loyalty is based on fear in North Korea. Um, which I don't think is a very deep bond of loyalty. But when people are faced with the decision of, do I go along or do I die? Do I go along or get thrown in a concentration camp? Do I go, go along or suffer greatly in some way, shape, or form? You get a lot of coerced uh, loyalty, so to say. But there are, there are various instances of people in the military leaving the country entirely. Um, the president of South Korea was stationed around the demilitarized zone, which happens to be the most militarized border on planet Earth, despite the fact that it's called the demilitarized zone. He was there, posted there for his requisite military service because all South Korean males have to serve in the military for a span when there was a North Korean soldier who engaged in axe murders, okay? There was another incident when a North Korean soldier went berserk and shot the other people in his unit and his supervising officer before crossing the DMZ and going, defecting to South Korea. Um, there are many instances of such things that happen because the conditions have become increasingly unbearable and unlivable. In, and even the military, which is prioritized, the elite in the military are prioritized in terms of resources, even they are more and more starving and being deprived of various things uh, as well. And so, yes, I would say there's a certain amount of variation, but there's a basic, uh, basic bond of fear and a lot of propaganda, but increasingly the basic needs of even the military are not being met. And that being the case, I think the grip that the regime has upon its own military even is weakening. You may have seen the news stories about the soldier who dashed across uh, and, or tried to dash across and eventually was pulled across, right? Uh, and he was being shot at, right? by his own fellow soldiers, because it's considered high treason to leave North Korea. But he was found emaciated, full of all sorts of parasites, and in awful condition. And in some ways, he is an emblem of what the common soldier in North Korea is suffering. And so I don't think that there are uh, truly uh, invincible sorts of bonds of loyalty uh, certainly not bonds of loyalty out of sheer love and devotion uh, to the supreme ruler or to North Korea. In my view, I think even the military would welcome a reunification with South Korea and the day-to-day -day benefits, great benefits by comparison that it would bring. What do you think the unified Korean Olympic team means for relations between North and South Korea? I think it's a great dog and pony show for North Korea. I think they get to um, put their propaganda on center stage in the Winter Olympics. And this has always been what they've done. They've always tried to purvey their propaganda, especially to South Korea, but also to the world. And so if you want to learn more about North Korea, don't listen to the North Korean government because it will usually be lies. <laughs> Uh, that would be the worst source to go to, to actually understand and figure out what's going on in North Korea. But, it, you know, they have more on their cheer team than they do athletes, right? <laughs> and so this is, this is a great propaganda opportunity for them. They want to get benefits from South Korea. They want to drive a wedge between South Korea and the U.S. Um, they have as their goal to get the U.S. uninvolved and uncommitted to defending South Korea because their final goal is to reunify the peninsula by force. And incidentally, they have this five-fold pattern that you'll see again and again when you study is they have this saber-rattling brinkmanship where they precipitate a crisis, 
get to the table who they want, negotiate benefits, swallow those benefits, break the agreement, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. It, it's, if you study this, you just see it over and over and over again. Um, and so they are trying to, they engage in foreign relations for tactical gain. That is what they do. And so I don't think this is any different from that. I think it's the same, uh, same sort of ploys that they are up to. What does a normal day look like for North Korean citizens? <laughs> do they do anything other than work for the regime? They're told everything, where they can live, they're given what they can wear, where they must work, if it's in a field or if it's in a mine or, you know, it's the most totalitarian state on planet Earth. Um, makes 1984 Orwell's nightmare look like a bargain uh, by comparison. <laughs> And so um, they can't, they're, they're basically in a straitjacket in terms of their lives. You can't even speak freely to your own family members for fear that one of your family members is going to snitch on you. And so day-to-day um, -day life is you, you don't have enough to eat, typically. Uh, your clothes may be in tatters and you will be doing difficult labor that you're forced to do for long periods of time, and that is your life. Um, you'll be listening to lots of, listening and watching lots of government propaganda because that's all that's allowed legally there. Um, kids are taken from their parents at a young age as well. Uh, school is propaganda basically too. Even arithmetic is propaganda. Uh, questions in North Korean arithmetic books are, you have a platoon of 20 American soldiers. You throw a grenade and kill 12 of them. How many are left? That's North Korean arithmetic. And so this is uh, almost unimaginably totalitarian. And that's reflected day to day in the ordinary lives of, uh, of the citizens. Was the fate of Kim Jong-un and the regime in the event of a peaceful reunification? And how could this influence their willingness to cooperate? Um, I, I say somewhat jokingly that we can like build an island and get Dennis Rodman on there and a nice basketball setup and you know, exile Kim Jong-un there, there with Kim, Dennis Rodman and, and you know, problem solved. Um, I'm, that's more jokingly than anything else. Um, <laughs> but I don't think the reunification can happen successfully under the North Korean government. That's not, a, that's not really a government. It's a criminal enterprise <laughs> is what the so-called government to North Korea is. And so um, are there ways, is there an arrangement that Kim Jong-un could potentially accept? Maybe. Maybe, I mean, uh, Napoleon was exiled to an island, right? Um, that, that is possible. It is possible that Kim Jong-un would just try to go down with a fight, right? And take down as many as he can with him. Um, but it is also possible that he may be prevented from doing a lot along those lines. Um, but, uh, the entire Korean Peninsula under Kim Jong-un would not be an acceptable solution. And so there would have to be some sort of solution to what do you do with Kim Jong-un and the top leadership of North Korea. Uh, that would be a necessary part of thinking about how to engage in reunification. Um, there is something called lustration, which means those uh, who engaged in some horrible crimes, are not allowed to serve in positions of honor, say, in the government of the reunified Korea. That is one instrument that could be used. Uh, lustrations is what it's called, uh, to give one example. But um, Kim Jong-un uh, and the Kim dynasty, in my view, have to go. And it is not an option to allow them to take over all of Korea uh, which is what they tried to do in the original Korean War and which would be disastrous for the peninsula, for the region, and for the broader world. 
How would you assess the Trump administration's foreign policy regarding North Korea, especially re with regard to its consideration of a preemptive nuclear strike? So um, there's all sorts of classified information that none of us here have <laughs> access to. And so what the top government officials in the Pentagon and elsewhere are advising the president is at best a matter of speculation uh, for the rest of us. Uh, I'm not, uh, let, let me tell you some, let me say some possibilities of what could be contemplated uh, along these lines and maybe give some comments uh, in regards to them. One recently uh, activated technology that is operational is a microwave defense where you send a missile that emits microwaves that fries the electronics without damaging the buildings or the people. That is one possibility that might be on the table being contemplated uh, by, by the administration. Another possibility would be to, if North Korea attempts another missile test, to try to stop it somehow, whether it's through cyber electronic means whether it's through the terminal high altitude area defense. Uh, there's various ways and various stages at which such defenses could be attempted. And it could be a demonstration of the defensive capabilities uh, that are there. Um, but there, there are an array of possibilities, array of options. I am not a general in the Pentagon, and I don't, uh, you know, I don't, uh, I'm not privy to the classified information uh, of the U.S. government along these lines, but I imagine a whole range of things are being considered. But this is also, in the meantime, part of the course of diplomacy that is happening, the military-backed, robust, strong diplomacy that is happening that is not only a, maybe more primarily a motivator to China than it is to North Korea where basically the U.S. is saying, China, take care of this. China, resolve this. Don't push things to get to the use of uh, even these limited uh, sorts of military means. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a message that is being sent, in, in some respects, more to China than even to North Korea. But I think only a robust, strong, yes, even coercive approach, is the only one that has a chance of working with a regime that operates on the basis of force, namely North Korea. They will not listen to anything else. And if you look at the history of what has been attempted in the past that has failed repeatedly, there's nothing else that has a chance. And so I actually think that using a strong policy of maximum pressure is a good policy with respect to North Korea. I'm not saying that's the policy you use all around the world, you know, as normal matter of diplomacy, but with respect to North Korea specifically, I agree with the policy of maximum pressure uh, that is being brought to bear. And I think if anything should only be ratcheted up and increased in terms of the pressure that is there. In the previous administration, it was stated that North Korea was maximally sanctioned. That was simply a false statement. They are even still not the most sanctioned country in the world. But now they've come up to, I think, the top four, last I read uh, in regards to this. But a key part of the sanctions, for example, is they have to be enforced and implemented effectively. You can have all the sanctions in the world, and if they're not implemented, they're not going to have the targeted effect. Ideally, it's done in a way that minimally, adversely affects the people of North Korea, and that it really is targeted primarily towards the governmental and military elite of North Korea. Um, but having these things in the background can help diplomatically with resolving the situation. Um, not having that in the background invites being ignored and actually endangers uh, the South Korea and the world even more because it would be an invitation to North Korea to potentially move forward with their plans. 
What do you think is the most desirable government type for a unified Korea? Well, I think um, what we have in South Korea, uh, a democracy, um, free market capitalism, um, these, in a sense, it's, it's almost the ideal lab to show the difference between a totalitarian communist dictatorship and a free market democracy just across the 38th parallel. South Korea is booming. Its economy, depending on how you rank it, is in the top 10 to a dozen in the world. This was a country that was the second poorest after the Korean War. And you have more uh, positives spread through the South Korean society by far uh, in a remarkable contrast with North Korea. To me, the satellite imagery is a metaphor of this. The satellite imagery at, at night, North Korea, is a sea of darkness and almost merges into the rest of the darkness of a picture at night. South Korea is lit up like a Christmas tree. This, to me, is a metaphor of the contrast between North and South Korea. Which systems have worked better? Same group of people. They're all Koreans. That's your uh, controlled variable, if you will, right? The, the control. And then you have these other variables of the systems. Which systems have worked better? To me, the answer is patently obvious. And communist regimes have always meant the crushing of the people and the masses by a few elite on top of the communist structure. The people own everything means the small elite, communist elite, own everything and take everything away from the people and throw them in concentration camps. That is what uh, communism has always meant in practice, everywhere in the world, every time it's been tried 100%. There's no exception. And so what, what systems work better? To me, it's obvious. Do you think there is a time coming when the people of North Korea will be free of their dictatorship? Yes, uh, I do believe that. I do believe it's a matter of when, not if. And I do believe the uh, Kim dynasty will be swept into the dustbin of history. I believe that. And I'm looking forward to that day. <coughs> Why does China continue to prop up North Korea? Do they do it to spite the West or do they have a legitimate reason? I talked about their fear of um, an influx of refugees, not wanting North Korean, uh, I'm sorry, US soldiers on their border. They also fear an aligned, a US aligned unified Korea. And so they're playing geopolitics, right? And so they want to increase their traditional hegemony over the region and the world as a rising superpower. And guess who is the lone superpower right now? United States of America. And so China, this tends to, in my view, dominate their mentality too much. They have a lot to gain, I think, from a unified Korea. There's a lot of positives, a lot of problems that it would solve. And yet, because of the predominant geopolitical strategic focus, uh, they want to think about how they can uh, increase their influence and power in, across the region and in the world, which is why they were against South Korea having the terminal high altitude area defense. They saw this as an aggressive action. This is a defense, a missile defense system, right? And they said, you know, we don't want this because why? They don't want the ability, they don't want US and US aligned powers to have the ability to shoot down their missiles where they would want to send them. And the more those exist around China, the more hemmed in they are in what they can do in terms of their military um, capabilities and range and so forth. And so they informally punished and sanctioned South Korea for accepting THAAD, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense. They've lifted those in exchange for the current South Korean government promising not to install more, among other things. But uh, China is largely playing this power game. Uh, and that is unfortunately predominating their approach to things. But it's not the only factor, 
And I think these other factors should be given more weight. And I think that uh, there are ways that China can be shown that it would be more in their interest overall to help in the reunification of the Koreas. How do we know what we know about North Korea? What are the sources of information about life there? As I mentioned earlier, don't go to the government. You know, uh, if you want to know uh, a fantastic view of, of North Korea, a fantasy view of North Korea, listen to the government. There's a major mine of defector, um, vein of defector and refugee testimony that is a major vein of information that can be tapped. There are those who are inside North Korea who are sending information out, sometimes at great risk. Um, there's a whole slew of documentaries uh, that are out there. There are increasingly more and more uh, books and articles and so forth that are increasing uh, over time. But those who can provide the inside view, either from inside the country or from those who have left the country, that is one of the best sources of information uh, that is there. Um, Google somehow persuaded North Korea to allow uh, North Korea to be viewed through Google Earth. Uh, however, they, they are, Google is limited in what they are able to provide. Uh, and so, you know, you have a picture of a concentration camp and they don't show a lot of details. And North Korea says, that's a farming village. What are you talking about? That's not a concentration camp, right? So they, uh, they will try to um, hide what they are actually doing and keep their enemies in a deep fog to use the phrase of Kim Il-sung himself. How do both North Korea and South Korea feel regarding the unification of the two states? Um, I think historically that there was a great desire for reunification in South Korea. North Korea, Korean propaganda is that they are going to liberate South Korea from American imperialism and reunify the peninsula by force. But in South Korea, there's a, there has been an increase in the number of people who are not in favor of reunification, especially in the, among the younger and middle-aged generations, where there are some who think it would be too much of a burden for South Korea, it would be too difficult, the societies have diverged too much, um, and so there's an increasing current in South Korea, um, especially among the younger and uh, middle-aged generations, uh, to not be in favor of reunification, so it's not as pervasive in South Korea, the desire for unification as it once was, it used to be very pervasive. It is less pervasive but still common to desire reunification in South Korea, but there is, incre there is this counter movement of those who are not in favor uh, of it as well. Does Kim Jong-un have an overarching goal or reason for governing his people in this totalitarian way? As I mentioned, and as I was saying before, there are three overarching goals. One is to promote positive sentiment in North Korea, in South Korea, towards North Korea, in South Korea. Two, to get the US to not commit, to be uncommitted to defending South Korea, which is why they keep talking about wanting a peace treaty with uh, the US. And then to take over the peninsula by force. He is also about his own aggrandizement and worship and wealth. He's estimated to have over five billion dollars in personal wealth while his people are starving, uh, while 75 percent are deemed to be malnourished in uh, North Korea. He wants to keep his grip on power. Um, you know, systems like democracies and free market capitalism tend to decentralize power. And he wants to keep his totalitarian grip on power and on what is going on. Uh, and so there are these overarching goals, but there are also these sort of personal goals, if you will, to hold on to wealth and power. How can you justify calling this the worst human rights violation when we ha are in the midst of some of the most violent crises in Yemen, Syria, et cetera? I know we have crises in Yemen and Syria, et cetera. I'm, I, uh, I'm aware of those and many others. Um, I, I, would, I would defy whoever questions this to study 
what is going on in North Korea and tell me that this is not worse. And to actually say this is better. I am skeptical that a in-depth study would reveal that answer. <clears throat> How has Japan responded militarily to North Korea's missile buildup? By building up its own military. There is talk of even modifying constitutional provisions that were made after World War II that restricted what they could do militarily. There's even talk about lifting more and more of those restrictions as they increase the numbers and technology and uh, so forth of their self-defense forces in Japan. Uh, this in turn is something that China fears as well. Based on viral videos in South Korea of people burning the North Korean flag, do you think South Korea would want or even allow a reunification to occur? I talked about reunification, I think, already, so I'll, since we're short on time, why seven years exactly? I wasn't making an exact prediction. I'm just saying it's possible. I see the possibility uh, in, the, in, in the next seven years. I would say uh, the reason why I said seven years, though, is because uh, I think this administration is handling North Korea better than any other U.S. administration I've ever seen. Uh, and, and so uh, if th that would be this rest of this term and possibly in a second term. Uh, and so um, this, this uh, administration understands and is approaching North Korea in a way that has the higher possibility of success than I've ever seen um, before. And I'm, uh, I think I'm pretty aware of what the prior administrations had done. The last administration, strategic patience, fancy way of saying do nothing, uh, did, did nothing uh, for about seven years. They did the most that they did in the last year of uh, the previous administration, which I give them credit for. I think they, the last year was better than the pre previous seven years combined. Um, you know, the administration before that took the North Koreans off the list of terrorist sponsoring states. For what? Well, and, you know, gave them various other concessions. For what? Uh, and uh, I don't think was able to really follow through and effectively resolve the crises that, that were there. The administration before that came up with the 94 Agreed Framework Geneva Protocol that gave heavy oil shipments and other benefits to North Korea. For what? <laughs> what, did, what did South Korea or world, the U.S., get in return for the 94 Agreed Framework except for give buying North Korea more time and more resources to be able to develop more fully its complete nuclear arsenal and delivery capabilities. That is what has happened. Uh, and I can keep on going in regards to this, but, um, but uh, that is the reason why I said seven years. What do you see as the role of current day Christian missionaries in North Korea? Profound, wonderful. Uh, like I said, it's the Christians who are risking our lives, uh, you know, who are going there and uh, doing a tremendous job of, of covertly reaching people with the gospel. Uh, it is Christians who are doing the most good in regards to North Korea by far. Uh, and so um, there is tremendous work of all sorts of kinds uh, going on along those lines. I pray someday, someday, Pyongyang would once again be more like the Jerusalem of the East and less like the totalitarian despotic regime that it now is. And that someday we can look forward to a reunified Korea where there will be justice and freedom and livability to an extent that has not been there during the entire time of the North Korean regime under the Kim dynasty. Thank you for your great questions and your attention. And um, I will plan on sticking around if people would like to talk further as well.